But, uh, you know, I'm thankful for Pastor Justin. But tonight you're going to see that I'm actually going to be telling you that about just saying the name of Jesus in times when you're in trouble. And so that, that song, Pastor Justin, just fits totally with this message. And so thank you for giving that to us. All right, Psalm 30. We're going to talk about this psalm, and we're going to tell you the whole aspect of it from David's perspective historically and how it applies to us tonight. So let's talk about Psalm 30. I titled it this, Joy in the Morning. There's some familiar verses that will be there. We'll be, we'll be quoting them to you tonight. Psalm 30 joins 12 other psalms that are perfect for praising God, uh, especially in mer His mercy for helping people through difficulties in their lives. This psalm is about how you can get some help from God through a difficulty in your life. It, it, uh, couples with other psalms that uh, I've given titles to. Psalm 9 was Justice Now. Thy kingdom come, 18. My God, my God, why, 22. Joy in the morning. That's our song, psalm tonight. Meditation on the Lord, Psalm 34, Psalm 40, from clay to rock. In his time, Psalm 75, 103, mercy over all. 108, singing in the storm. 116, when death can't get uh, through the door. 118, mercy, mercy, mercy. 138, uh, why worship. And 114, battle and blessing. Man, can't you wait until we get to Psalm 114? It's going to take 10 years. All right, so here we go. Psalm, let me just tell you about it. Psalm 30 was written by David in what I call, uh, whew, that was close. How many of you ever had one of those? Man, that was close. Close call. Have you ever had a close call? An almost disaster? Well, even if you didn't, you probably did and didn't know it. We will never realize how many near-death experiences we could have had if God hadn't, hadn't uh, short-circuited the devil's plan for you. For example, coming here tonight, uh, there were three accidents. Uh, basically, I could have left the house a little earlier and I could have been in one of those accidents. God knew that. The other day, I was traveling down 119 and I came and there was a car in front of me and a huge tree fell straight in front of that car. Didn't touch the car, but uh, had either one of us been in a different position, it could have killed us. It would have crushed us and killed us. The tree was about that big around, fell straight across the road. And uh, I watched it. I watched it fall. So there's, how many of you know that God has protected you? I mean, you, tra you ask for traveling mercies. You would never know until you get to the other side that he's protected you. Um, truth is, Satan can't take your life. Let me repeat that. He cannot take your life. I like to say it this way. He can knock you down, but he can't knock you out. Satan does not own a knockout punch. All he can do is oppress you. All he can do is go against you, but he can't knock you out. We also, according to Scripture, as human beings with a free will, can actually choose life or death. The Bible tells us that. Proverbs eleven nineteen: As righteousness tends to life, so he that pursues evil pursues to his own death. When people pursue evil, the Bible says eventually that evil is going to kill them. And I could, I could cite one instance after another when that has happened, and so can you. In the way of, life, in the, way of the righteous, Proverbs 12, Proverbs 12, 28. In the way of the righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. It's an assurance to you that choosing God, you choose life. It says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. They're not there. And it's up to you to choose. Jeremiah tells you that. Our God, here's another one, is a God who saves from the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. So just knowing God uh, is an escape from death for you. Ezekiel 33, 11 tells us the same thing. God's telling Ezekiel to tell the people of Israel, tell them, as sure as I am the living God, I take no pleasure from the death of the wicked. Did you notice that? He doesn't, he doesn't take a pleasure when the wicked die. He doesn't say, oh, that's good for them. He doesn't say that. I want the wicked to change their ways and live. God's all about life. He's not about death. And uh, so we have to understand what God is telling us here. He's giving us some. Now look at our psalm in Psalm 30, 30, verse 3. It says, You brought me up from the grave, O Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. That's Psalm 30, verse 3. We're going to revisit that a little bit later. So for David, this psalm is a thanksgiving from a close call. The pit, is the King James uh, talks about, is the grave. It's not hell. I don't share it much anymore, but before I was 19, I had about 15 close calls on motorcycles. 15 major accidents. Some were pretty nasty. All were, were all possible death rides at 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour, choppers, ones with not, no front brakes. When you can completely demolish the side of a car and your motorcycle and walk away without a major injury, you know that that was a close call. This psalm is also a psalm about sickness and recovery and close calls. Psalm 30 verse 5 says this, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And we're going to read that psalm, that, that verse, in a couple different translations. So before I explore its full implications for us tonight, let me place Psalm 30 next to 1930. If you're here and you know the, how our psalm study goes, you know how the books that I've written talks about how the dates uh, the, the, uh, of the psalms, the 19th book of the Bible, 
parallels the 1900s. 1901, Psalm 1. 1902, Psalm 2. You can see in history the parallel to them. So can we see it in 1930? Was 1930 a close call for Israel? Uh, and for the world? Let me give you a worldview. The 20s were, were entering into a new decade. Nick, new decade. So let me give you the different ones that are there. For the 1900s to 1909, they were called the seductive singles. Uh, there was pleasure. It was everywhere. It's from the gay 90s, and it's not gay the way you know it, of the 1890s. But there was pleasure. The 1900s, 1900s to 1919, there was pleasure everywhere, especially in the United States. Then you had 1910 to 1919. They were called the terrible teens, believe it or not. That was World War I. The 20s were called, you know, what were the 20s called? The Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties. And the Thirties were called, does anybody know? Anybody know? The Dirty Thirties. That's what they were called, the Dirty Thirties. And so, uh, for lots of reasons. And what specifically was happening in 1930 around the world, and especially in Palestine, were pretty interesting things. Let me give you a couple of in the news directly from that. February of 1930, Poland, 14 Jews facing trial in Warsaw for religious views. The Jews are starting to get persecuted again. Then we see this happening in, uh, in uh, March. In March, Balfour, writer of the famed letter, died. This is the Balfour Declaration, giving Jews their homeland. Uh, we see then something going on the next month, in uh, April. April it says, New York scientist predicts man will reach the moon by 2050. So we're watching things going on that are kind of interesting and also kind of kind of worrying. We see this last one in October is really the one that hits me. Nazi deputies scandalized the Reichstag, attending in uniform at Hit Hitlerian stones, and they stoned Jewish shops all over Berlin. This is October of 1930. That's when it started. 45, the war is going to end, but it's always, it always has its roots way back in 1930. Then on the 20th of October, British published Passfield White Paper on Palestine. I'm going to read some of that to you. Asking a halt in Jewish immigration to curb Arab unemployment. You know, the, the first rumblings of a problems that are happening in Israel are starting to happen with the Arabs because the Jews are coming back to the homeland. That last item in October 20th, 1930 is extremely important. The world is lost in the Great Depression. Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo of Japan were scheming uh, behind in the shadows. And the riots of late 1929s where the Arabs had attacked and killed hundreds of Jews at the Wailing Wall. If I took you to Israel today, and I take you to St. Stephen's Gate, you can see the bullet holes from the 1920s, you, 19, 1929. The Arabs started to attack Israel and started to attack the Jews that were in, at the Wailing Wall. Again, remember, it's not a homeland yet. It's a homeland, but it's not a, a nation yet. They're attacking them. It prompted Great Britain to establish a community uh, commission to determine the rights of Muslims and Jews in connection with the Western Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. But more important was the publication in 1930 of the British White Paper. Uh, it's called the Passfield Paper. The, these two papers uh, written down, uh, excuse, whittled down Jewish settlements and gave Arabs full control of the Temple Mount. The reason why the Arabs have control of the Temple Mount today and the walk is it was given to them in 1930. In 1930, the British, who owned the land, gave the rights to the Temple Mount to the Muslims, to the, to the Arabs. It was a severe blow to the Jews and favored the Arabs who had, who had uh, perpetrated the riots of 1929. I want to read you some of that paper because many of these things get lost in history. 1930, Hope Simpson injury inquiry follows recommendations of Shock Commission in analysis of land opportunities for Arabs. October, the Passfield's second white paper, first attempt of British disengagement from Jewish national home. They started to disengage. disengage. Ball four dies. They said that they were going to give them the home, and like Indian givers, they took it back. They said, no, we're not going to give it to you as a home anymore. There were too many problems that went on. So the declaration of the mandate limited Jewish immigration to Israel. So they started to limit how many Jews can go there. It went further. Zionist Jews in the 1920s for such changes in the status quo, the Jewish worshippers brought benches in a screen to separate men and women at the Wailing Wall, which were removed by the police several times. The Deputy District Commissioner noted in 1927 that several incidents and many problems caused by the Jews around the questions of the, of the Barak plainly indicate that they have laid down a plan of gradually obtaining this place. So they started to approach the Wailing Wall, and this the Wailing Wall is on outside of the Temple Mount. And so the, the, uh, the Muslims who were up on top of the Temple Mount with the Dome of the Rock didn't even want them to come near the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall is, is actually a remnant of the wall of Herod's wall around the city. It's not even about the Temple Mount. It's on the Temple Mount, but it's not the Temple Mount itself. So the Arabs were getting antsy. They said, we don't even want them anywhere near this. Uh, so the tensions escalated and the ensuing violence resulted in riots in August of 1929 with thousands of casualties on both sides. The British sent in a commission of inquiry to investigate the cause of the disturbance the commission, headed by Sir Walter Shaw, uh, arrived in Palestine in October of 1930 and remained there.
there for two months. One of the recommendations he made to the Secretary of State for the colonies was the need to establish an ad hoc commission to determine the rights and claims of Muslims and Jews in connection with the Wailing Wall. And so here's what, here's what was decided. One, a commission shall be entrusted with the settlement of the rights and claims of the Jews and Muslims concerning the Wailing Wall. The commission shall consist of members not of British nationality. On June 13, 1930, the members of the new commission sailed for Palestine, arrived on the June 19th, and stayed for one month. The commission was appointed by the United Kingdom and approved by the League of Nations. That's a, that's a prerequisite to the United Nations. After hearing testimony from many people, the, the commission concluded the following: A, the Muslims belong the, to the Muslims belong the sole ownership of the sole proprietary right to the Western Wall. So the British took back what they told the Jews, and they said the Muslims now own that wall. You can you, you, you uh, they are they're the ones that have full responsibility of that wall. Now watch, here's what Psalm 30 verse 9 and 10 says. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. Jews needed helper, helper at that time. They needed the, the Lord to help them. To the Muslims, this is the other thing they said. Uh, there also belongs the ownership of the pavement in front of the wall and the adjacent so-called Maghrabi quarter opposite the wall. So I'm going to show you some pictures of 1930. I'm going to show you the Wailing Wall. And it's totally different than today. That right there is a pavement. You see the wall over here? That's no longer there. It's a big plaza right now. The Jews, all they could do is get in this little pavement and worship at that wall. And the Muslims were fighting them because they didn't want them on that pavement. That pavement was, pushing, was pulling Jews from all over the world. They started to pray at that wall, the last remnant uh, that they, that's closest to where Solomon's temple was. That's the pavement. The British said they can't. They can't block that payment. They can't put any. They were putting a screen between the males and the females, and they told them they couldn't do that. And they also said that the the Muslims owned that pave, pavement. Now that has nothing to do with the Temple Mount. But they gave it to them. On the other hand, the Muslims shall be under the obligation not to construct any building or build any edifice or demolish or repair any building uh, within the walk of property. They weren't allowed to demolish or build. That's still in place today, and they just went against that two weeks ago. So the Jews shall have free access to the Western Wall for the purpose of devotions at all times subject to the explicit stipulations mentioned herein. So they gave them access to the wall, but, they, but the wall was Muslim. I, I don't know if anybody even understands that. It says, any special fast and assembly for public prayer that the chief rabbis of Jerusalem may order to be held in the consequence of some public distress or calamity, provided due notice shall have, shall have been given to them by the administration. They had to give them permission to go to that wall. On New Year's Day, the Day of Atonement, they also, on any other special holy days that are recognized by the government, such days which has been customary for the ark containing the scrolls of the law to be brought to the wall. They had to ask them to be able to bring a Torah to that wall. They still have to do that today. If they're going to have a bar mitzvah, they still have to have permission from the government and from the, from the waqf to be able to have that, that par mitzvah. The Jews shall not be permitted to blow the ram's horn near the wall. It shall be prohibited to bring to the wall any tent or a curtain or any similar object. The temporary enacted prohibitions against bringing to the wall benches, carpets, mattings, chairs, curtains, and screens. No object or obstacle shall be raised to the Jews in their individual capacity, carrying with them to the wall handbooks or other articles. That since has been repealed. But they weren't allowed to do anything. They were just allowed to go to that wall and pray. That was it. It was such a strictness that was going on. So when you see Psalm 30, Psalm 30 says, who's going to be my helper God they're, 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 they're limiting me and they're, they're putting me in the pit they're putting me in a, in a tough spot so we see that that's exactly what was happening in, in that time again that link was, I showed you was in, in Psalm 30 verse 9 the pit here implies a trap to enslave the Jews everything they did was a trap uh, they, if they went against it sooner or later someone's going to take their privileges away and they're not going to even be able to go near that wall yes 1930s brought temporary peace but the greater threat to lie in their future so let's go back. So that's what happened prophetic. Or that's what happened historically. But what about David? Why is David writing this psalm? And what does it have to do with you and me tonight? Why did he write it back in 1042 BC? Well, look at the we'll look at the title of it. This is from my Bible. The title says, "A Psalm and Song of the Dedication of the House of David." Does anybody know what the House of David is? Does anybody know what it is? It is not the temple. Everybody would say the temple because David never built the temple. This is his actual place he lived. He's dedicating his house to God. It's down from the temple. Actually, I'm going to show you where it is. It's a song. It's a, song, a psalm and a song at the dedication of the house. He wrote this song, this psalm, as he dedicated after building his house. And it was a massive house, by the way. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 tells us that David had conquered the enemies of Israel and had built himself a house of cedar on Zion's hill. Here's where he built it. This is Zion's Hill. That where I wrote in, that's David's house. There's a church 
of the Dormitian Abbey, uh, Caiaphas's house, David's false, David's tomb, the Last Supper. So it's very close there. Let me show it to you on a modern map. Map that is the church of the Holy. That is the church of the Dormitian Abbey. Dorme to sleep. This is the road going around. This is the pinnacle of the temple. This is the wall going around Jerusalem. This is a road that goes around Jerusalem. This is the southern area. This is Mount Zion. David's house is right here. Uh, everybody believed it was right there, and recently it was found. It's in Milo. It's gigantic. And every time we go there, we go down to it. It, goes right, it leads down towards the Gihon Spring. David's house was built there. He does not build his house on the top of the mountain because it's settled for God's house. That's going to be up here uh, where the temple is going to be. He will never build the temple, but he builds this house and he dedicates it to God by, by, sing, by singing and writing this psalm. How many get it? All right. So obviously, right after David's annihilation of his enemies and his building of his house, trouble comes his way. We know 2 Samuel says this. It says, After the king was settled in his palace, that's his house, the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. He said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. It's about 1,040. He wanted to build God's house. He started, to, he started to accumulate all the cedars, all the silver, all the gold. He'll pass that on to Solomon. David's not allowed to build the house of the Lord. He's not allowed to build a temple. Anybody know why? Because he had bloody hands, and he, and he couldn't do it. God forbade him to do that. So he builds his house, and he dedicates it. Now, let me give you a little background history. Most scholars believe there's a gap in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse, between verses 1 and 2. And in that gap, David has a near-death experience. From his, uh, for, uh, so he's from his house, the desire to build God's house. There's some type of gap in time there. We can see that scripturally and prophetically. And probably from some illness that, are, that was almost fatal. So David, in between here, in the verses 1 and 2, he builds his house, he has rest from his enemies, but he gets some type of illness that almost takes his life. Something happens. So Psalm 30 then is an expression of praise after healing from a close call. David just didn't get up and write psalms. He wrote them based on life situations. And he wrote, based, he, he wrote them based on needing God's help many times. Have you ever noticed it yet in your life that when all seems to be going well, the devil pops up and, and looks to destroy your joy through some calamity or problem? You ready for a Mark Corellian quote? One is never more tested than in the moment of excessive good fortune. Let me repeat it again. One is never more tested than in the moment of excessive good fortune. My example, Jesus' three temptations came in the height of his popularity. In the height of it, the devil took him to tempt him. So your good fortune many times, and you see that, you know that, everything's going well and you have this thing in your back of your head saying, man, this, is, this seems too good to be true. Uh, and that happens to many of us. Now, now just, just listen. So sometimes, the happier we are in life situations, the more blindsided we can become to Satan's darts. God's blessings always bring Satan's sneers. You don't think Satan's going to want you to just keep God's blessings. He doesn't give up. He doesn't go on vacation. Say, I've never heard Satan say, well, I think I'm going to go to the mountains for this weekend. Or I'm going to go down to the beach and just take a little time off. He doesn't take any time off. You see, happiness, now listen, happiness is never in our power. Never. But pleasure is. And pleasure isn't happiness. And happiness isn't joy. Let me, re let me repeat that. Pleasure is not happiness. And happiness is not joy. You may think if you have some pleasure, you're happy. But I know lots of people who, who, who have pleasure, but their minds still are on, at, at ill ease and they still have troubles. So happiness, pleasure isn't happiness. It's a false to think that. And happiness isn't joy. There's a big difference in that. We're going to talk about it. Psalm 30 isn't about happiness. It's about joy. And it's not about pleasure. It's about joy. I would never exchange joy for happiness. There's a big difference. See, I could be ill and still have joy. I can be unemployed and still have joy. I can be destitute and still have joy. I can be poor and still have joy. I can be impoverished and still have joy. I can be hungry and still have joy. I can be all alone in a crowd and still have joy. Happiness has wings. Joy has roots. Happiness is based on your circumstances. Joy is not. Now, you see, joy isn't always getting what we want, but letting go of what we don't need. In Psalm 30, David lays out a sequence of thought for us when things aren't exactly working out as we planned. But I love this psalm. Let me tell you why. Because life doesn't always work out the way you planned it. Somebody say amen. So you need more than happiness. You need more than going from one happy party to another. You need something that's going to take you through the tough times in life. Psalm 30. Let me give you an outline for it. Here it is. It says, thank God I'm not dead yet. Everybody say, thank God I'm not dead yet. You are on the right side of the dirt right now. So listen. Two, thank God it won't stay dark forever. Everybody say, thank God it won't stay dark forever. Thank God my problems produce praise. 
thank God I can wear the garments of joy rather than the rags of happiness. So let's dive in. Thank God I'm not dead yet. Watch. I'm going to read it for you. Here it is. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast made my foes to rejoice over me. Not made my foes to rejoice in me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. So there's his sickness. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Now, tonight we all share some common bonds. Our problems, as diverse and crippling as they are, haven't killed us yet. If you have problems tonight, you don't want you to raise your hand, but you can raise your hand. We all have problems. Yours may be different than mine. Mine may be different than yours. Mine may be light this week. Maybe they're heavy this week. Yours may be light this week. Maybe yours are heavy. Maybe you're facing the worst thing you've ever faced this week. We all have problems. This message is for every single one of us. Every one of us here, every one of us listening on Facebook, every one of us listening out in, in YouTube land. It's for every single one of us because we all have problems. It's called life. Listen. Unless you realize how to extol the Lord and let Him lift us up, we will lose our joy in those problems. There are a lot of Christians who have lost their joy because one problem or a series of problems came their ways. Here's a checklist, a surefire way for you to know that you're losing, for you to know that you're losing your joy. You ready? Here's your prescription for losing your joy. Make little things bother you. Don't just let them make them bother you. you know how many people make little things bother them? They're going to lose their joy. It's not worth it. Listen, I came that close to death. Nothing bothers me. Somebody said, as a matter of fact, I said that uh, the other day, and Jennifer, who is, who, and Chad, Chad, who has listened to everything I've ever preached, said, oh yeah, you, here's your list of things that you said bother you. <laughs> so, you know, people that are, that are on, that don't know how to drive, you know, and so, but I'm talking about nothing gets to the point of me that gets me bothered. Listen, lose your perspective on things and keep it lost. Don't put first things first. Get yourself a good worry, one about which you cannot do anything but worry. Then you'll lose your joy. Listen, some people, all they want to do is worry. If you worry, you're going to lose your joy. Let me give you another one. Be a perfectionist. Condon condemn yourself and others for not, uh, not achieving perfection. Five, be right, always right, perfectly right, all the time. Uh, be the only one who is right and, the ri and be rigid about your righteousness, your rightness. Six, don't, what does it say? Don't trust or believe people or accept them at anything but their words and weakness. Uh, weakness. Be suspicious. Impute ulterior motives to them. Seven, always compare yourself unfavorably to others, which is the guarantee for instant misery. Stop comparing yourself to others. God made you unique. There's eight billion people on the planet. God made no one like you. Amen. I told Cheryl, God made no one like me. She said, thank God. <laughs> Take personally with a chip on your shoulder, everything that happens to you that you don't like. Nine, don't give yourself wholeheartedly or enthusiastically to anyone or to anything. You want to lose your joy. Make happiness the aim of your life instead of bracing for life's barbs through a bitter, bitter with a sweet philosophy. This is not a, this is not a cakewalk. Life is not a cakewalk. If you go to a church that tells you things, that, oh, everything's fine, you're, it's great, you're, you're going to the wrong church. This is a, life is a series of bittersweet moments with sweet moments. Somebody say amen. That's the reality of life. Use this prescription regularly for, and for a while, and you will be guaranteed to have absolutely no joy. No joy at all. I could stop right there and we could have had church tonight. In verse 2, David cries out to God to heal him. If you can check any of those points in your life, then you need healing tonight. Mentally, emotionally, or physically. David knew when he was sliding mentally, emotionally, and physically. Look at verse 3. He talks about the pit. And by the way, there is a slide that you can do. The sliding of emotions. Back. Listen, let me show it to you this one. This chart that I made. The sliding board emotion of sickness. When we go from well-being into prolonged distress or sickness, it can yield a time of sorrow, which sinks our spirits and eventually turns into anger, which will further lead to depression, which will lead to a time of in the dependency and blame shifting to others coupled with financial strain which will lead to despair which will eventually lead to false guilt and hopelessness which places us in the pit the pit listen this is how it happens it's a slow progress you get you take one bad step down and you keep going all the way down look at verse 3 and what it says verse 3 talks about the pit uh, what is a pit well the, the Hebrew word is bower it means a hole a prison a dungeon the well. Some of us put ourselves in our own dungeons because of the way we think. I call it stinking thinking. We don't think right. Listen, there are so many things that can bring you into the pit today. 
Have you, anybody ever heard somebody say, boy, that's the pits? It's from this. That's why we say it. Here's just a couple of them. A trip to someone's house who you don't like. I'll put you in the pits. Out of town guests that you're not really crazy about coming to stay with you for a week. An irate, rude person in line in front of you at the grocery store. An unexpected bill in the mail. A teenager's lack of responsibility. An unfulfilled ex expectation from your, from your spouse. The Joneses getting another new car. Come on, how many are understanding? An unfavorable doctor's report. The Joneses getting another new car. A breakdown of your furnace or your air cooler. That'll put you in the pits. Getting a flat tire. The pit is used to describe Sheol or hell, by the way. Lots of things feel like hell, don't they, to us? But I promise you, they're not. David praises God because in light of all his bad experiences, you ready? He's not dead. You know, when I was lying in a hospital room and, I was, and I was, they were telling me that I might die that night and I, I didn't die that night, everything instantly stopped bothering me. I, it was like, hey, I'm, I'm alive. I'm, thank God I'm alive. Somebody say, I'm alive. That's, that's amazing. You're alive. Nothing has killed you yet. Isn't that great? Not dead. None of his enemies made him die. None of his problems or his difficulties have killed him. They haven't you or me either. Secondly, thank God it won't stay dark forever. You know, it's not going to stay dark in your life forever. I promise you there's life after darkness. Even if, God forbid, you, let, you, you lost a spouse. Many times, for many people, they may not be able to see it in the moment, but there's life after that. Listen, it may be dark in your life right now, but thank God it won't stay forever. Look at Psalm 30, verses 4 and 5. Say un sing unto the Lord, O ye saints, that's you and me, of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endures for a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I love that verse. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Yes, you're going to cry. Yes, there's going to be things that bother you. But trust me, you know God. Joy is going to come in the morning. Don't you read scripture? In Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those that are called and believe in God. Come on. It's about us understanding God's protection over our life. Nothing bad that happens to you is going to keep you in that state if you trust God. Somebody say amen to that. Look, verse 4 is a command to us. It says, look his saints. And it has to do with our attitudes. Your attitude and your, your attitude is going to determine your altitude. You're only going to go as high as your attitude brings you in, in life. Listen, notice it doesn't say give thanks because everything looks great in your life or, or give thanks because you've got it made. No, it says give thanks when you remember his holy name. I'm sick, but oh Jesus. He sang it today, saying the, na the name of Jesus. I'm sick, but oh Jesus. I'm troubled, but oh Jesus. I'm hurting, but oh Jesus. It's a key to remember. David's praise isn't focused on his healing, but on remembering God's holy name. When I lay sick and, and in a hospital room in MD Anderson and thought that I was going to die and everybody else did, you know what I say? God, don't heal me for me. Heal me for your namesake. Not for me, not for my family, for your namesake that you can get glory from this. Sometimes when life situations are overwhelming, all you can say is, oh Jesus. Do you know how many times I've heard people tell me they were ready to hit a car, they're on interstate and all they can do is grab the wheel and say, oh Jesus. That's all you have to say is, oh Jesus. You command all of heaven when you call on that name. You command all all of his power when you call on that name. David is saying, I'm going to praise him no matter what happens. No matter if I have a sickness or what, I'm going to praise God. Listen, the ancient Jews and even modern Jews know how to remember God. In Judaism, there's a long white robe called a kittle. This is what it is. It's a kittle. If you were a Jew tonight, you'd understand what this is. It's a garment worn at Rosh Hashanah services and Yom Kippur. It's a white linen robe. For a Jew, this is the same robe worn by a dead person when he's buried. It's called a shroud. It's the exact same robe. So when a dead person is buried, they wear that. Now watch. It's also the same garment worn by the groom on his wedding day. No implication of death there. So why would you have a garment that's worn on sorrowful times, the most sorrowful times, and the most joyous times? Why would God command them to wear this garment on the most sorrowful times and the most joyous times? One reason and one reason only. For his anger endures for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now I'm going to give you something that's talking, when I talk about deep Bible study, I'm going to give you something and tie something together for you so you can understand it. Because this kittle is all over the New Testament. Jesus tells us about it all the time. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound him in linen clothes. That's a kittle. They put a kittle on him. 
wound them in little clothes with the spices and the manner of the Jews as the manner of the Jews is to bury. They buried them in kittles. In Jesus' time, the kittle was a shroud. It didn't have arms. It didn't have a neck. It just went straight over you. They did that in a wedding. They did that in a death. They did that, they did that in the, those types of services. They did that in, um, in uh, basically when, when they had a dead person, when there was a wedding. And in Rosh Hashanah, they put that over them. It was like a tent. Let me show it to you again. Then comes Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher and sees the linen clothes lie. That's the kittle. If you want to see it some more, I'll show it to you again. The armies of heaven, was Revelation, were following him, white, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. That's the kittle. You're going to wear one, I'm going to wear one. We're going to be in the armies of heaven, we're going to come back with it. White and clean. It's a symbol of God's power. It's a symbol of being under God's protection. Whether you're having a joyous moment, like a wedding, or whether you're having a sorrowful moment like a death. How many are with me tonight? And so we see it. Listen, it's all over Scripture. We know that that kittle is about that protection of God. It's time we thank God because no matter how dark it gets in our life or your life or mine, it won't stay dark forever. That kittle goes through a whole bunch of different things, reminding you that God is over every single one of them. Third, David says this, thank God my problems produce praise. Satan hates when you praise God through your problems. It's amazing. If you keep praising God through your problems, Satan's going to give up and give up and bring you problems. I mean, if it's going to bring praise to God, it doesn't do him any good. He wants to bring you misery. He's the eternal terrorist. He wants you to, he wants you to worry about every single thing. He wants you to fret about everything. He wants to bring you problem after problem after problem. But if every time he brings you a problem, you praise God, guess what? It's going to frustrate the devil and all of his enemies. David knows it. Why do you think he sings psalms and writes psalms every time he has a problem? When we're reading through the psalms, we're on Psalm 30. We're going to go all the way through Psalm 150. Every one of those psalms written by David starts out down in the pits and usually he praises all the way up to the top. Why? Because he knows how to beat the enemy. He knows that the enemy is coming at me to get me depressed, to get me down, to get me sluggish in my faith. I'm going to, I'm going to praise over this. If I praise over it, I'm going to accomplish something. My, my problems are going to produce something. They're going to produce praise. All you need to say are four small words. Lord, be my helper. Here it is. You ready for it? Here's what he says. And in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide my face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. I asked you, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall I declare thy truth? You know what he's saying? What is it good for, what's good for me? What, what do I profit if I get so low and depressed that I can't praise you? What, is that, what does that profit me? He says, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise you? Shall I claim thy truth? Declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. He's petitioning God. He's saying, God, as low as I get, pull me out of this, God. Let me be able to praise you through this. Because I know you want praise. I know you don't want me to be destroyed by this. I know you want praise. So God, use this, whatever it is, to praise you. David's got some scars in his life. He's saying, I, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm hurting God. He's very honest. Very open, very transparent. He's saying, God, I'm hurting. I need you. What, what profit is it if I get pushed all the way down? If you allow this to happen to me, and God allows everything, by the way, if you allow this to destroy me and I allow it to destroy me, what profit is there in that? What profit is there in me complaining all the time, worrying all the time, being in depression all the time? Lord, be my helper. Your scars are testimonies of your healing, by the way. Some of you have my second book. The forward there was from my friend David Reaver. David Reaver is an amazing guy. He, was, he, had a, he had a hand grenade, a phosphorus hand grenade, blow up in Vietnam while he was holding it this close to his face. He went underwater. Phosphorus doesn't go out. It burned, I think it was burned something like three quarters of his, of his body. He has a false ear. He has, as a matter of fact, he comes, last time I saw him, he was playing the piano at the church. And he told the people, he says, I play by ear. And he took his ear off and started playing the piano. <laughs> Just an amazing guy. But his scars are really, listen, your scars are testimonies of your healing. The best the best way you can testify is through your hurt. When you're hurting, that's the best testimony. When everything's going well, really, you're not really depending a whole lot. You may be depending, but not like you are. Listen, the closest I ever got to, to the Lord, and I've never backslidden, was on a, when, when I was moments away from death, when I had stage 4 cancer. That was the closest I got to go. My, my challenge now is to stay that close when things are okay. That's the key. Listen, I have many major scars on the outside of my body. Above my left eye, just under my brow, are two inch, is a two-inch gash hidden by my eyebrow, which I almost shaved off the other day. I don't know why. I was trimming my eyebrows, and I went the wrong way. And I realized I shaved half my eyebrow off. And Cheryl told me she's going to take all my razors away from me. 
But it's hidden under my eyebrow where I almost lost my left eye. I have a one inch gash on my left thumb where I almost lost a thumb on a radial arm saw. A one inch hole under my right thigh where I almost pierced a major artery and bled to death while I was stealing cigarettes out of a burnt out store on, on, in the boardwalk of, of one of the cities in New Jersey. I have a small half inch hole through my left ankle from an antenna of a car when I flipped a motorcycle straight over a car at, night at 60 miles an hour and the antenna went through my, went through my ankle. I have some pre-planned scars uh, inflicted to uh, ward off larger problems like scars from uh, orthoscopic surgery. Uh, some physical scars are internal. Two holes in my heart I was born, born with. Uh, I had a heart scarring from medic fever at birth. Lots of scars. We carry them around all the time. And some you can't see inside or outside because they're emotional scars that I grew up with like a father dying when I was young or like not knowing who I was. But, my, but all my scars, all my wounds prove that I'm healed. A scar proves that you're healed. If they're not bleeding, nothing's bleeding out of me anymore. I'm healed. Listen, there is no blood flowing from my scars today. No pain. Everyone can see my physical scars. They are a testimony that I got hurt, but I live to tell about it. Now those same problems can be related as praises to God. Praise God, he brought me through this. Praise God, I flipped that car and didn't die. Praise God, I was stealing something and fell on a, fell on a nail and it pulled out a, a corpuscles out of my, out of my leg and I, I'm still alive. Thank God I did this. Listen, your scars prove that God's real, that he heals. So do you have any scars today? What if I asked you to come up here and list all your physical scars? Or maybe I asked you to come up here and list all, list all your emotional scars or your financial scars. What are you going to do with them? Are you going to complain about them? I know some people that complain about every scar they have. There are guys I used to go to church and I would say hello to somebody say, how are you doing? Oh, my arm's hurting me today. <laughs> Next week I'd go and say, oh, you know, I have this bursitis. Next week I'd go in and he said, man, I have this, my finger, I just smashed it. I remember, I'm the same guy, I remember going in and I said, how are you doing today? I, start, I almost didn't want to ask it anymore, but I, I pre-planned it. I said, how are you doing today? He says, oh, I don't know. I said, I think my knee's out of joint. I said, listen, you have 208 bones in your body. Pick one that works. <laughs> You don't have to complain about everything you have. <clears throat> if you have any scars today, they're either in one of two stages. Either they're still bleeding or they're healed. If you're still bleeding, your cry has to be, Lord, be my helper, just as David's was. And if they're healed and you want to use them as a testimony to others, your cry has to be the same, Lord, be my helper. Help me tell someone else. Lastly, tonight, number four, thank God I can wear the garments of joy rather than the rags of happiness. Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12. This is what it says. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and guided me with gladness, girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praises to thee and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Remember, David's writing this because he's deathly sick of something. Something's, something's almost taking his life. And I believe he's writing it during the exact process that something's taking his life. And so now he goes from, from the depression of that thing all the way to joy. Listen, maybe you need these joy verses tonight. They're all over scripture. And I, want to, I don't know if I'm going to read them all to you, but Psalm 30 verse 5, for his anger endures for a moment, what we've been talking about, but his joy comes in the morning. Psalm 32, 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you that are upright. Psalm 35, 27, let them, let them shout for joy. Psalm 42, 4, whereon I remember those things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitudes, I went with the, them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise all over scripture we're talking about joy being poured out because God wants to give it to the righteous I'm not looking for happiness tonight happiness is fleeting many a clown hides a hurt if you don't believe me when Robin Williams was, was alive you can ask him he was, uh, he was hiding a hurt he was the funniest man around hiding a hurt it eventually took his life it's not about happiness tonight if somebody gives me a thousand dollars yeah I'll be happy but they can't give me joy if they take a thousand dollars away from me I'm going to be unhappy but they're not going to take my joy away from me because my joy is something that lasts Throughout, the, throughout my life. Listen, if I know Christ, John 9, 15, 9 to 15, I've loved you the way my Father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. I'm reading from the message. If you keep my commandments, you remain ultimately in my home, at home in my love. That's what I've done. I kept my Father's commandments and made myself at home in His love. Jesus is talking. I've told you these things for a purpose, that your joy might be, that your joy, listen, your joy might be your joy and your joy wholly matters. I can't give you my joy. Jesus is asking you to, to be like him as he was with his father. This is my command. Love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. 
Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. Joy, the, the acronym is pretty interesting. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. That's the joy. That's the command of God. You want the command of God? Stop thinking about yourself only. Wow. You know, Christianity has become a me only type of thing now. People go to church and say, oh, can God give me? Well, you know, give me a word. Give me this. Give me that. Give me this. You know, I want to feel good, so I'm going to church. I want to be spiritual. I'm going to... That's you. Joy, real joy is Jesus first. What do you want, Jesus? Well, I, can't... I want to give you everything you want, Jesus. I want, I want to give you your glory and your praise. Others second. Man, it's liberating when you think of somebody else in front of yourself. Somebody say amen. So let me ask you tonight. Are you confused? Are you hurt? Do you have scars? Are you chasing, fleeing happiness? Our whole, our whole nation's chasing happiness. We have people who want more and more and more and more. And basically, all they're trying to do is get something that's going to give them happiness. It will never last. Or do you want lasting joy? Let me leave you, leave you with a couple things tonight. If you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. Billy Sunday said that. Joy. The kind of happiness that doesn't depend on what happens. Here's your daily checklist for joy as a joyous Christian. Don't let little things disturb you. Face each day knowing Jesus does all things well. Give all your cares to Jesus. He heals, he guards, he guides, and he saves completely. Stop worrying. Do good and then let the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit give the results in your life. Remember what you think is impossible to God is nothing more than a passing breeze. Trust Jesus that everything will be okay, for it's better to trust than to doubt and miss a blessing. Do not do God's work for him. He convicts, he convinces, he'll be the judge. Look for the good in everyone and don't find fault. Live so that all who meet you, meet Jesus. Know that Jesus is with you and nothing else matters. I've been a pastor for many years, and I've counseled a whole bunch of people. And let me tell you something, I've counseled people who sat in my office and cried their hearts out and thought they would, that it was the worst thing, whatever it was that would happen, whether it was a divorce, whether it was a child dying, and whether it was a spouse dying. And listen, I, I, I sympathize with them. My heart was there, but I knew deep in my head something that I couldn't tell them and deep in my spirit. You're trusting God, you're going to be okay. Yeah, you may be sorrowful tonight, today. That's part of life. But if you trust God, you're going to be okay. You know, when, I'll, I'll say this, and it's probably going to tear up Cheryl when I say it. I was laying in my hospital bed in MD Anderson. It was, it was a bad time. It was the time that they thought I was going to die that night. And Cheryl was praying and, and crying. And uh, my family was alerted. They all knew. I, was, I had an infection. I was in chemo. I had no, I had no white blood cells. And uh, the doctors kept coming in every two hours because they pretty much thought that I was going to make it through the night. And I remember with tears in my eyes, and I wasn't really crying much, but I remember tears in my eyes, Cheryl over me. And Cheryl was claiming, she was believing God was going to heal me. But you know, sometimes you can believe something and you just don't see it. I wasn't feeling it. I, I trusted it, but I knew ultimate healing for me could be God taking me. So I remember looking up to her and she knows what I'm going to say. I said, I looked up to her and I said, Cheryl, knowing that I was going to die, or actually sensing I was going to die, I said, you'll laugh again. And she looked at me with this, she actually should start crying more when I said that. But it's the truth. You'll laugh again. Of course you can't replace someone. Of course there's things that, that hurt us in life and there's scars and you take them with you. But God's there with you. Come on, somebody say amen. Sometimes your joy is the source of your smile. But sometimes your smile can be the source of your joy. Sometimes you just got to force yourself to smile because that will bring out the joy. And I love this. This is, your, this is your verse for the week. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Tonight I'm going to ask you to stand with me for a moment. Now, you know that I know that this is meant for a whole bunch of people tonight. Yeah. You know that I know that people are going to write to me and tell me, man, this is the message. And I want them to do that because this is not coincidence. It's not coincidence that we're, that we're, we're studying this, this psalm in detail. It's not coincidence that you're here tonight. These are divine appointments. It's not coincidence that people are listening in tonight. Uh, it's not coincidence. This is a divine appointment for everyone. We hear the word of God. It goes out and accomplishes that which it's set to. So let it accomplish what it's set to. If you came in here tonight with troubles and all kinds of things on your shoulders, I understand. We could trade troubles all day long. I understand. Nobody really understands your troubles like you do. You know, do you ever talk to somebody and, uh, and they tell you everything that's wrong with them and you realize that, man, I want to, and you can't wait till they stop so you can tell them everything that's wrong with you? 
People don't even want to hear what's wrong with you. Did you know? All they want to do is tell you what's wrong with them. Instead of telling people what's wrong with you, tell them what's right with you. Amen. Let them see Christ in you. Father, I just thank you tonight. I thank you that in all of our troubles, all of our scars, Lord, you are a healer. I'm thankful that joy can come in the morning, Lord. Yes, we'll have sorrow for a night, but joy can come in the morning. Lord, I'm so thankful tonight that you're a God that will, not let us, that will not let us stay in our condition, Lord God. That you're a God that will heal us. I am so thankful tonight, Lord God, that your promises are always to us. I am thankful tonight, Lord, that, uh, that I'm not dead yet. Even though even if I die, I will live again. I'm thankful tonight that it won't stay dark in my life when it gets dark forever. And I thank you, God, that none of my problems will produce anything except praise. That's what I want. And I thank you, God, that I can wear the garments of joy rather than the rags of happiness. Thank you for the joy. May joy just spread over us tonight, Lord God, that people can see it and want it from us, Lord. That is the mark of a Christian, the joy of the Lord. It's our strength, Lord God. Bless those tonight that are here, Lord. Continue to comfort. Thank you for, for being a solace to those who have come and needed this tonight. Bless us all, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen.